Down in Red River County, Texas, folks trusted Chief Deputy Sheriff Douglas Jackson to uphold the laws. Instead, he used his badge to break them. Tonight, former Deputy Jackson has become a criminal and a fugitive. Hey, you hear that backfire? Man, that was great, man. That sounded just like a gunshot. That was... Wednesday, September 10th, 1980, around midnight in Clarksville, East Texas, 21-year-old Glenn Shadid was out riding with two friends, all portrayed by actors. That's heard all in Paris. <laughs> we went down to nearby town, got a 12-pack of beer, and just riding around, seeing the country. Roger acting up in his pickup, showing off his loud pipes and driving fast and stuff. As we started out of town, he said, the place behind us, turn around and look, showing sure enough it was. What are you gonna do, man? Well, don't slow down now. Get it! Yeah. Come on! The pickup raced out of Clarksville and into Red River County, where Chief Deputy Sheriff Douglas Hicks Jackson was waiting. Jackson had worked at area police departments for 15 years. He had a reputation as a tough cop with a short fuse. We knew we'd outrun them because we'd done it before. And we did. Until we run off the road. The pickup landed in a ditch on Peter's Prairie Road. You little smart ass, you almost made it, didn't you? But you didn't. Get out of that truck, you son of a bitch. Get out now. The driver, Roger Lernard, was arrested. Deputy Jackson ordered Shadid to follow the arresting officer back to the Clarksville jail. Yes, sir. Because everybody started town, they drove, and I followed it 80 miles an hour in the tank. And Doug Jackson was behind me. They're going to be some good ones. We got a good judge this year. They're going to be some good horses, show. Come on, right there, boy. Come back here, little lady. Put your stuff out on the desk right now. What for? I'm locking you up, boy. You're going 80 miles an hour, you're getting locked up. That's all there is to it. Now get your stuff out on if the desk. If you want to give me a speeding ticket, give me a little piece of paper, I'll sign it. But I... Shadid knew the law. A Texas resident with a valid driver's license and registration cannot be arrested for speeding. A ticket is the only penalty. I knew I was in the rat, and I wasn't going to go to jail over something I knew I was in the rat for. You can't arrest me for speeding. You want to watch. You can't put me in jail. According to Shadid and other witnesses, here's what happened next. Put my hands up, and I said, wait a minute. Slung me around, and he started beating me with something. Come find out his flashback. He kept telling me, he said, I'm going to teach y'all little smart SOBs to start respecting the law and all this. I'm going to tell you now. You ready? Come on. I get one phone call. I want to make it. Are you sure you want to come out of there? Sir, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Come on out. Slammed me up against the back wall and went to beating on me, whooping on me and everything. And I asked him, I said, what are you doing this for? And you just about have enough of this for And he asked me, he said, you want to be carried out or you want, or you want to walk out? I'm going to tell you one thing. You say a word about this to anybody, I'm going to dig a ditch and put you right in it. When he threatened to kill me, right then in my mind, I had, I, I had my mind made up that I was going to go to somebody to see if I couldn't get this straightened out. Shadid was stitched up, bailed out of jail, and went to see attorney Jim Dick Lovett. Lovett has a reputation for taking on some of the most controversial cases in East Texas. I looked Glenn straight in the eye, and I asked him if he was telling the truth. And he looked me back straight in the eye, and he assured me he was. And I believed him. Lovett was convinced that Shadid's civil rights had been violated. He drew up a lawsuit against Red River County, the city of Clarksville, and Chief Deputy Douglas Jackson. About a week after the incident, Jackson was on patrol with 23-year-old Deputy Jerry Roten. The lawsuit was no secret, and Jackson wanted it stopped. So he planned to set fire to Lovett's office, and Roten would be his accomplice. Jackson told me that, and he said he knew Jim Dick Lovett had lots of cases going on, big money cases, and he said he thought if he burned down his office that he'd just drop the shattered deal because he'd have more important things that he had to tend to. I don't get around so good anymore. I'm thinking I can call the guys in off a of patrol, 
He can take care of the building. I thought I should help him. I, I felt him. obligated to him. September 18, 1980. Douglas Jackson and Jerry Roten met in the county barn next to the jail. Jackson handed Roten a can of gasoline, a box of wooden matches, and a pair of gloves. I had on old clothes. I went down in the drainage ditch. It was really dark. Meanwhile, Deputy Jackson called Clarksville's police officers off street patrol for a meeting. I worked my way down to where the building was, came up out of the ditch and went across to it. I was wondering how, how are your people operating. And raised up a window, poured the gas in. Maybe they're going out of town the same way every time. Threw in a match. Is that right? OK, well, that's good. And I turned around and ran back to the ditch. The, the building was just totally in flames before I even got back to the ditch. Even the roof was burning. Roten helped put out the fire, and Jackson was there directing traffic. Jim Dick Lovett watched as his building burned. I was thinking about 25 years of work, uh, files, uh, books, uh, memories. In my heart, I knew it was Jackson. It had to be Jackson. The law office of Jim Dick Lovett was a total loss. The next day, Deputy Jackson mailed an anonymous letter to Lovett. It read, your family is next, and was signed, Inferno. Lovett hired bodyguards to protect his family. Despite the intimidation, Glenn Shadid saw his case through and received $5,000 in an out-of-court settlement. Douglas Jackson never admitted to the beating, but he was forced to resign. Five years later, Deputy Jerry Roten turned state's evidence, forcing Douglas Jackson to trial for burning down Jim Lovett's office. In July of 1985, just before the statute of limitations would expire, Douglas Jackson was indicted by state and federal grand juries. He pleaded guilty to arson and obstruction of justice. Jackson was sentenced to five years in prison. His new wife, 26-year-old Deborah Lynn Jackson, herself a former police officer, was beside him at his sentencing. The day that Doug Jackson reported to the federal penitentiary, my wife and I were so relieved that it was the first time in five years that we felt we could walk out in the sunshine. After a year in prison, an aging and underweight Douglas Jackson was transferred to the federal prison honor camp at Leavenworth, Kansas. On December 20th, 1986, according to U.S. Marshals, Deborah Jackson drove to the prison and waited for her husband. With no bars to hold him or fences to scale, Douglas Jackson simply walked away. They told us that he was coming to kill me. I don't think Doug Jackson will walk up and shoot me from the front, but he'll sure shoot me in the back. If he wants me shot from the front, he'll send that mean wife ahead. U.S. Marshals believe Deborah Jackson drove the getaway car, which was sold in Pensacola, Florida, six days later. Douglas and Deborah Jackson have not been seen since. Douglas Jackson is 51 years old. He has a habit of constantly combing his hair and washing his hands. He's usually quiet, but he has a violent temper. Jackson has a severe skin infection that requires medication. In Texas, he liked to eat at the local Pizza Hut every day. He doesn't drink or smoke. He's an expert handler of firearms. His wife, Deborah, is 29 years old. She has reddish blonde hair and blue eyes. She's wanted for a probation violation after being convicted for writing bad checks. If you've seen the Jacksons, the U.S. Marshals would like to hear from you. They're standing by here in our studios. Call us toll free at 1-800-CRIME-88. You don't have to tell us your name. Coming up next, Carmine Esposito, accused of a cheap and senseless murder. Please help capture him. We'll be back with his case.